We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is co-founder of Franco Nevada and past president of Newmont, Newmont Mining, Pierre Lassonde. Thanks for joining me today, Pierre. A pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, Tom. Thank you very much for your time. And also uh, thank you to our friend, Laura, for the introduction. So I wanted to maybe start by asking you how the low interest rate environment around the world is affecting the gold price right now. Um, well, the... Two main factors that uh, affect the gold price long term are, number one, the value of the U.S. dollar vis-a-vis -vis other currencies. That, I would say, is about 80% of the value of gold. And the second one is what we call a real interest rate. So the reason why the interest rates are so low, of course, is because the debt keeps going higher and interest rates are being suppressed which means that the real rate of interest is negative in, with inflation. Like today, they, they report inflation in the U.S. is like close to 4%, and you have like interest rates of, you know, like the 90-day T-bill is down at point, you know, zero something. So you have negative interest rate, and that is always good for gold. Always. I mean, if you look at the 70s, when the gold price from 1976 to 1980. When the gold price went from ninety dollars to eight hundred dollars, inflation kept going up, but the um, and the interest rates that uh, kept going up, but the rate of inflation was always ahead of the interest rate, and the gold price just took off. So the the first factor you mentioned there, Pierre, was the the value of the U.S. dollar, and of course. In a way, it's it's a it's a race to the bottom. Everybody's you know printing printing or borrowing more more of these currency units into existence. So, what what factors do you think will affect uh, the value of the U.S. dollar? Do you think that the global demand for U.S. dollars will help support it for much longer than um, other currencies like it? Go, I call gold the anti-dollar, okay? The, the dollar is the reserve currency. And when the reserve currency is strong, you don't need gold. Mm -hmm. And when the reserve currency is weak is when you want that insurance, which is called gold. It's, it's as simple as that. So if you look back the last 30, 40 years, when the dollar back in the 80s, for example, under uh, Ronald Reagan and Volcker, the dollar was very strong. And the gold price was flat at 350 for like, you know, 15 years, okay? You really did not need gold, okay? Um, now, the situation is very different. When you look at particularly the US, but also Europe, the $6 trillion deficit spending that's being put forward and already the, you know, $4 trillion package that have been approved, what the U.S. is doing is they're doing everything to devalue their currency and particularly against the Asian currency. That's where the mismatch in valuation really is. It's, it's against the Asian currency, uh, the yen, uh, but definitely the yuan, but a lot of the other currency as well. Something I've heard you speak about in the past is the Dow to gold ratio getting back to one to one. We've mm -hmm. seen it twice in the past in 1930 and 1980. So do you still expect to see this happen? Absolutely. Absolutely. And never two without three. And that's one of my motto. And so it's already happened twice. And uh, what's interesting when you look at the uh, that particular ratio is the way it happened uh, twice in the past is, is very different. In 1929 to, uh, in 1929, 1934, it was a very short uh, cycle, very, very short. It was uh, barely five years. Uh, but in 1929, the, uh, the Dow was over 360. And by 1935, it was down at 36. So it, the Dow lost 90% of its value while gold essentially doubled in price. And that's how you ended up with a one-to-one -one ratio. In 1980, it was very different. Gold went from $35 to $800, while the Dow actually peaked in 1967 at 1,000, went down to 600 through the, six, the 70s, 
And then by 1980, it was on the way up. And it was, you know, 800 at one point, but it was not back to its peak of 1,000 that it reached back then. So it was off 20%. So when you look at, you know, the next three to five years, which is when I expect the ratio to go back to one to one, it's 18 today. Um, the, uh, you know, is the Dow today is 35,500. Well, you say, well, can the gold price go to 35,500? I mean, it's a bit fanciful to be, you know, very candid. Even I don't, you know, I look at that and it's like, you know, really? Um, but can you expect two to one? Uh, you know, two to one would still be 17,500. We're at 2,000. Okay, well, 1,900. So I expect that we will see the Dow Gold in the very, very low single digit, like, you know, one, two, somewhere in there over the next three to five years. And it's not necessarily that gold goes up all the way to meet the Dow. It's that the Dow could come down as well, right? That is correct. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think there's a lot of people out there much better than I at you know, valuation of the Dow that say the Dow is possibly as much as 40 to 50 percent overvalued. Now, you know, will it go back down to 17,005? Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But you know, let's say it goes down to 20,000. Um, well, you know, now you're looking at, you know, a, a one to one, a two to one, 10,000 to 20,000. Is that possible? Entirely. Mm -hmm. So you've been through seven gold cycles in your career, Pierre. Can you give us some perspective for where you believe we are in this cycle and what indicators you use to gauge this? I just hope I don't look that old. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, th I think that looking back at uh, the, the various cycle, the one that's probably the closest to where we are today, in my mind, is the 1976 to uh, 1980 cycle when the uh, uh, the gold price went from 90 to 800, and um, we saw inflation. We saw uh, you know the oil price uh, took off, and we're in a, a situation today, to my mind, that's very similar. Uh, the uh, oil companies have been beaten down over the head by the environmentalists. You don't drill, you don't do anything. But the fact is that there's a billion cars on the roads. You got to, you know, you, you got to fill them up. Okay. And, and you know, so uh, where is that going to come from? And so I, I look at the, the, the gas, the natural gas, I look at uh, oil and to my mind, we're in a squeeze very much like, it's all temporary, like, you know, two, three, four, five years, but we're in a squeeze very much like the 1970s were. And on top of that, uh, back in the early 70s, the government, the U.S. was spending money on the Vietnam War. They were printing a lot of money. Now it's like, you know, it's environmental causes. It's like reconstruction of infrastructure and, you know, intellectual. So, I mean, they got all the right words, the buzzword and everything else. And it's also true in Europe. So the conditions are, to my mind, very similar to the 70s. And that's why I expect that the gold price will really ramp up over the next, I'm looking at three to five years as the, the crucial years. So as, as, we, as, as you're talking about the oil price rising, isn't that going to cut into the margins of the gold producers as well? Because the, the raw cost um, that goes into producing their gold will go up? Yes, the energy is 25, roughly, percent of the cost of, uh, of producing gold. And this is one of the conundrum for the industry, because if you look back at the 2001 to 2011, in that 10-year time, you know, remember, the gold price bottomed out at 250 in 2001 and then went all the way up to uh, over 2,000 bucks. And the stocks did not do anything. The equities were dead in the water. Why? Because the, their margin went nowhere because their cost structure went completely out of hand. And um, this time around, I think the industry is far more aware of it. And uh, they're, you know, shifting more to electricity, uh, which is a far more stable, especially if you have hydro. It's a, it's a, you know, or nuclear, it's a stable price for a longer term. 
And uh, on the, um, some of them are shifting to natural gas as well, which is much cheaper on an energy content. So the industry is far more aware of it. And also the, the other reason why in, two, in the 2001, 2011, the, the margin shrank is because the industry did not increase reserve and they went for low grade. And by doing that, they upped their cost structure automatically. And this time around, you know, you hear every CEO say, well, we won't do it again. We swear we won't do it again. So if, if they don't do it again, you're not, you will see margin expansion. So when, when you talk about the need for CEOs to be disciplined, are, are these some of the factors that, that you're talking about? What about um, acquisitions in the space as well? Well, definitely on the cost structure is one of the main factor discipline. If they want, if CEOs care about their shareholders, they have to stay very disciplined on the cost structure. That, that's number one. So don't go for the low grade and, you know, dive and, and, you know, blow up your cost structure and then you end up delivering no margin expansion whatsoever. On the acquisition, the, you know, so far the trend has been we will only do acquisition at uh, at par. Okay, we're not going to pay any premium. That I am not sure, to be honest, Tom, how long that will last. Because when you look at the quality of discoveries out there, there's a few that are really interesting discovery, but. We still haven't seen, you know, like the, the 15 plus million ounce high grade discovery that we used to see in the 80s and the 90s. And But there's a lot more money being spent on exploration. And my feeling is that if, as and when those this type of discovery starts to come up, there will be bidding wars for those. And for good reason. You know, and I would not blame a CEO for paying up for, you know, a great deposit with you know, open pit three gram material where you can make some serious uh, money. And uh, I would expect that there will be bidding war for those type deposits, especially the 15 plus million ounce type deposits. So Pierre, when when we're talking about, or or when we've heard in the past that the equities tend to lead the metals in, in appreciation, does this kind of depend on margins as well? You know, we were speaking about margins being really low in the last gold cycle and equities being basically flat, as you said. Does that really play a role in the equities leading the metals in the in the price appreci- appreciation? No, I don't think so, Tom. I and and frankly, I don't even know myself why is why is that? Why it is that equities lead the bullion, except that when I look back at, you know, the last 30, 40 years of trading history, that's always been the case. So I put it that the equity players are smarter than the bullion guys. But, you know, do I know? I don't. So you created something called the Lasson curve, and it describes the, the life cycle of a junior mining company. Pierre, can you describe it to our listeners, uh, you know, what it is and how it can be instructive to investors? Yes, actually, I'm thinking of tweaking it a little bit after 20 some years and I was thinking about it over the weekend. The the Lausanne curve I created when I wrote uh, my book back in the early 1990s, and it was really to give an appreciation to the investor of what... uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say a typical mining company, but on a, on a time value basis, um, where the company stocks and the relative risk reward ratio is, that's the way I look at it. So when you look at the Lausanne curve and the X axis being time and the Y axis being uh, the share price, usually you have uh, exploration companies that will go on for five, seven, 10 years, some for sometimes 20 years, and the stock is 10 cents. And they keep funding the company and it goes from, um, you know, moose pasture exploration to consolidated moose pasture exploration to worldwide consolidated moose pasture, you know. <laughs> and you essentially, the companies are being um, recreated every five years because the, the share count blows up and 
the shareholders essentially lose all the money. And that's the vast majority of exploration company. And that you have to understand. In my book, I followed something like 3,000 companies over a 10-year period. And of those 3,000, only about 27, if I recall, had any asset worth anything after 10 years. And of those, only seven actually went to production. So those are the real numbers, okay? So you like you don't fool yourself. So what happens that they, they get a discovery, so then the share price goes from 10 cents to like $10 or $20, depending on how much blue sky the, um, the market can see. And where then what happens is a very steep correction when I call it reality sets in. When you do have to do a 43-101 that tells you, well, that's exactly what you got. Like the blue sky may still be there, but here's the reality of what we have now. And then another reality comes in when you do a feasibility study, because then it says, okay, given the size of the deposit, given the metallurgy, given the site, given the access, given everything else, it's going to cost you so many hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. And that's a very sobering exercise. And that usually signaled the bottom of the share price. And uh, then you have a construction decision, a funding decision. And at that point in time, once construction start, the uh, curve starts to inch up a little bit. And then as construction goes and, you know, the news comes out, we're on time, we're on budget, the share price keeps appreciating. And the maximum net asset value per share is the day that you actually turn on the, uh, the mine, okay? That day you have maximum NEV. And uh, then after that, it's a question for the company to keep replenishing the reserve to keep that NAV up there. So on a risk reward basis, the best place, to my mind, to buy, you know, an equity is when you you are at that bottom where you have a feasibility study, where you have the cost structure, and where the company is funded to production, and it's selling at fifty percent of NAV. So on a risk reward basis, it's hard to miss, and sometimes they're selling at thirty percent of NAV. You know, I'll give you a really, really good example. Lundin Gold. Four and a half years ago, when Lucas bought Fruta del Norte, he did an issue, and the stock was $4.25. And I looked at it, and you had, at that point in time, real reserve. You already had a feasibility study. You knew what it was going to cost. And the NEV was, to my mind, at $1,500 gold was around between $10 and $12. So I said, you know what? That's a layup. Okay, so I bought some shares. The stock flatlined essentially for three years because construction started, but there was like, you know, is Ecuador going to work? Nobody had ever worked there. Um, you know, everybody has been late, the budget have always exploded. So like the market did not believe for three years, the stock just flatlined. And finally, literally three months before the end of construction and the start of the production, the stock went from 450 to 1250. That is on a risk reward basis is the absolutely the best place to buy any stock. Any, any gold equity or any mining stock for that purpose. Yeah, it's a it's a very instructive tool to kind of give investors some perspective and, and think about exactly where in that cycle that, that they're investing, right? Mm -hmm. well, That's correct. I mean, blue sky is nice. I mean, I, and I'm the first guy that love a good exploration story. There's no question about it. And there are, but you have to understand that your risk reward ratio is not in your favor. Right. Okay. And, and your book, of course, that you were speaking about, Pierre, is called The Gold Book, The Complete Investment Guide to Precious Metals. Since you wrote that, is there anything else that you would like to update in there, Pierre? 
oh, the reality is that the book has to be completely rewritten. Mm-hmm. I mean, the uh, companies that were mentioned then, there's only very few that still exist today. Uh, the turnover in mining companies is fiercely high uh, because of discovery, because of change acquisitions, and the, the size of the industry is totally different. I mean, back then, you, you know, a company that was doing a million ounces a year total was a giant, you know, and today you got Barrick, you got Newmont at seven, eight million ounces. So the, and also the, the market, the gold market is completely different. Back then it was 90% jewelry and 10% everything else. Today it's 40% 40 to 50% jewelry and 50, 60% everything else, including investment, which is a huge component. It wasn't then. So very, very different uh, market. It has to be all rewritten, and I just don't have the 1,200 hours to do it. Mm-hmm. So as, as you're talking about the, the investment demand and, and the jewelry demand components, do you see investment de- demand increasing as a, as a ratio over, let's say, jewelry demand over the next five to 10 years, Pierre? Yeah, gold is a, an interesting metal. It's a, a, a two, I call it a two-faced metal. On one hand, it's a commodity, and that is the jewelry sector, okay? And as a commodity, it answers to, you know, economic 101, the lower the price, the more the demand. So the jewelry side of the business gives you a floor price. So when the when the gold price starts to go down, the Indian jewelry market puts their hands out, like, give it to me. Okay, we'll take it because they are very price sensitive. The Middle East is very price sensitive in the jewelry market. The investment demand is the other side of it. And it's more like an insurance uh, uh, type policy where, whereby if um, you think that you know your house is in a, a drought area and there's going to be fire danger, or you know what, or, or and then you see a fire starting in the corner, uh, you know of the property. Would you call your insurance agent and say, hey, "Look, I'll buy an, ins- an insurance. I don't care about the price. Like you know, just get me an insurance, okay?" And that's how gold behave as an investment. Is people are buying an insurance, and oftentimes the price doesn't matter. They just want the insurance. So, Pierre, I'd like to go back to investing in the equities a little bit. And something uh, you and I spoke about a little bit before uh, the call here was how do shareholders punish companies for capital capital expenditures? Well, you know, I don't know whether or not shareholders really punish the, the companies uh, because, uh, you know, they probably do like I would do. I just sell and, you know, so, and then the, the stock price starts to drift down and then the, the company is uh, I- incapable. If it's not generating enough cash flow, they can't go back to the market uh, because their stock are trading below net asset value. And it's about the only way that you can restrict capital. You know, but the bankers, they if there is demand, they will do anything. Okay, like, you know, because they, they're in for the commission, so they don't care. And the only way that you can restrict uh, the demand or access to capital is by drift, by, you know, essentially having a stock price that's selling below NAV where the board says, well, we can't sell, the, you know, our, our best purchase is actually our own stock. So we're not going to go sell the stock. And then it puts the company in the bind. So as investors, do we need to, in a way, reframe how we think about capital expenditures if they're creating more value in the, within the company? Absolutely. I think that every shareholder, when looking at investing in a company, has to really ask himself whether or not the expenditures are creating real shareholder value. And that's very important because if all you're doing is trading dollars or worse, you know, I call it diversification, you know, instead of diversifying, they're diversifying. And uh, that kind of management, you, you, you don't want to be part of it. So, Pierre, if we look at the, the royalty business that you and your partner, Seymour Schulich, pioneered in the mining space with Franco Nevada, do you still see the royalty space as one of the best types of business models? 
Oh, to be honest, I think it's the best mis- business model ever invented, ever. Uh, when you think about Franco Nevada today with like 36, 38 employees, revenue over US 1 billion a year, it, it's quite incredible. And the, and you know, I'll be honest, when we started the business, Seymour and I, we did not really understand how powerful the business model was uh, for many, many years. But at the end of the day, it's all about optionality value in the land. And uh, so, and, and, you know, they all say in our business, the best place to find a gold mine is beside a gold mine. So when you have the kind of optionality that we had in on the, the tens of millions of acres of land that Franco has, what you find is that the companies, once they've built a plant, they will do anything to keep it going. And they will drill and they will go down in grade and they will, you know, do a lot of brownfield exploration. And that all happens at no cost to the royalty company. And that's where the, uh, I call, what I call the uh, optionality value really um, kicks in. And, you know, I, I like to give the, uh, when we bought back Franco Nevada in 2008, we had 20 million ounce of reserves and 30 million ounce of resource in, on the books. 10 years later, the 20 million ounce were mined, okay? And if you look at the uh, Franco Nevada annual report, guess what? We had 20 million ounce of reserve and 30 million ounce of resource. All of that at no cost to the Franco Nevada shareholders. That's how powerful the business model is. So having your perspective in that in that let's say that corner of the industry peer is it possible that the royalty space is a little bit crowded now well yeah you know is it is it crowded uh, it's definitely you know getting um crowded but very much like the mining business itself what you find is that you know you have three very large companies at the top with you know tens of billions of market cap, then you have a few intermediate companies, and then you have a whole host of small companies with you know 100 million to whatever 500 million of market cap, but some you know a lot of them with little or no revenue, and you know the, the their purchasing power is their shares. So, so how do you do that? You know, how do you compete with the big guys? Because Franco is still buying small royalties. And um, it makes it very, very difficult. So my sense is that if any of these small companies are lucky enough to um, be uh, involved with a deposit that's looking really good or that, you know, with exploration will become a major producer, they will probably disappear. Otherwise, they will just float down the, the you know the river, and there'd be no reason for anyone to acquire them. So you and I spoke previously about uh, about the optionality in the land, as you were as you were mentioning in the previous couple of yep. uh, answers here. So yep. tell us about the importance of having maybe a trimetallic deposit, like having copper, silver, and gold. Um, how how do you go about evaluating these types of deposits and which ones are most likely to go into production? You know, Tom, I, I don't think that there is any big magic in there. At the end of the day, the any deposits where the cost or the margin is 50%, uh, these deposits will go into production, whether they're polymetallic gold or, you know, single or copper. But to my mind, at this point, in time, the best deposit that you one can find is a copper gold deposit. And uh, because I look at copper and the next sort of like 20 years is gonna be incredibly good for copper. You know, our entire civilization rests on one metal and that's copper. Without copper, we have no transportation, we have no communication, we have no modern cities. You have no no elevators, no air conditioning. Think about this, okay? No building can be more than you know four stories. You got to walk up, right? So, 
And it's only going to get better for copper because today, only 15% of terminal energy use copper. The rest of it is mostly oil and gas. And if you look at the next 20 years, it's going to be 50% of terminal energy will be electricity. So I look at copper, and the beauty of copper deposit is that they're 20, 30, 40, 50 years, 100 years long. Like Cobre Panama, where Franco has a royalty, has current reserves of over 40 years and resource of 100. Okay, so what gold mine goes for 100 years? None. Okay, like, or I should say, well, the South, some of the South African gold mines, I think, no, they're not 100 years old. No. But so from a longevity standpoint, the other form of optionality is price. So you imagine having a 100-year option on gold. That's where the beauty of copper gold deposits really is. It's is you get a long you get optionality, you got price optionality and then you get also land optionality. I mean, and, at, Cobre, and, at Cobre Panama, I, you know, like, even though they have, I don't know, 5 billion, 8 billion ton, they just found another billion ton three years ago. Okay, like another billion ton deposit next door to another one. I, it keeps on giving. It's, you know, but it's 100 year already. So, <laughs> yeah. And, and as you say, you you have that that amount of time to spread over a couple of different um, gold cycles and copper cycles, right? That's correct. Yeah, that's the real beauty of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, Pierre, you served as the as the chairman of the World Gold Council from 2005 to 2009. What were the biggest things you learned during your time there? Well, I was part of uh, the uh, Chris Thompson and I. Chris was my predecessor, and we're the two who created the gold ETF. And that was part of the, the mandate, my, the way I looked at it. When I became involved with the, uh, you know, I, I was vice chair and then I became chair. <clears throat> I said to Chris, we have, a, we have to find a way to make gold, you know, um, available, you know, instantly to everybody so that it can compete against the dollar. How do we do that? And then that's how the idea of an ETF came around. And uh, sorry, Pierre, that was, was that the was that the GLD ETF? Yeah, the GLD. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's how GLD was created. Okay. And uh, it came out in November two thousand four, and it's been the most successful gold instrument ever. Ever. I mean, you know, today uh, there's close to a thousand tons of gold in the uh, GLD. It's absolutely incredible. And if you want to know where the gold price is going, just look at the uh, the movement of inflow or outflow in the GLD. And when it goes in, gold price goes up. You know that already. Okay. It's like one for one. So, Pierre, something that gets brought up a lot when, when we're talking about ETFs is counterparty risk. How do you see, when, when you guys created that, how did you see that counterparty risk and, and try and mitigate that? Uh, in the GLD, there's no counterparty risk because every ounce of gold that is purchased, uh, it that day, that ounce of gold goes in the vault in London. So essentially, there is no party risk. The, the entire amount of the GLD is in a vault in London, and I've been in that vault, and I got to tell you, it's absolutely incredible to see. I mean, at the time that I went there, I think there was about, you know, 500 ton of gold and um, every brick is uh, entered and, and it's audited every three months. Uh, once a year, there's a complete audit and uh, every bar is marked. And uh, so there's really no counterparty risk. I mean, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the vault itself is uh, secured like, I don't know how what to, how to say, but to my mind, there is no counterparty risk. Excellent. So, Pierre, you've given over a hundred million dollars to create programs like the, the Lassonde Entrepreneur Institute. Have you found that the development of these programs and meeting those that go through these programs more rewarding in some ways than building companies? 
Oh, you know, that's a very, uh, very good question. It is that particular program has been the most rewarding uh, philanthropic endeavor that I've ever done. And uh, to see the number of uh, students and, and uh, you know, who gets uh, scholarships and they, they graduate, they have jobs, they, uh, and, you know, like they become real entrepreneurs. And we've created um, literally billions of value and the, the university gets a little percentage. So the University of Utah today, in terms of revenue from intellectual property is listed as number four in the United States because of the Lausanne program, because we actually value the, I, the, uh, intellect, the IPs of our, you know, researchers. And it's been, and the whole university now is in on it, okay? Like every researcher knows what we're doing. So incredibly satisfying for me. There's no question about it. But I'm enjoying both. I'm enjoying, you know, uh, creating wealth, creating, uh, you know, helping young entrepreneurs uh, start their companies. I'm involved in a number of new companies over the last four or five years um, you know, a young generation, and it's so nice to see them. And uh, at the same time, I value immensely to be able to take, you know, uh, part of that money and helping the art community, the education and what else. So to me, I've got the best of all world, really. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree more, Pierre. Um, as, as you have that perspective, though, of of helping younger younger entrepreneurs and also the the experience of building these companies. What is it to you, do you think, that is one of the most important skills for younger people to be developing and or, you know, really keeping in mind to try and build right now? Is it maybe, you know, having the, having critical thought? Is it being disciplined? How do you, how do you think about that? Um, I mean, one thing that I, um, I, I go back to is um, uh, what's his name? I'm looking for the uh, author. Um, the the, the uh, I'll flip the, the name escaped me for now, but the, the famous uh, 10,000 hours. Malcolm Gladwell? Or Malcolm Gladwell, exactly. Okay. And uh, when I read that that book in particular, it was like, this could have been me, okay? Uh, like, you know, First of all, go get the education that you need to get you where you want to go. Two, get your 10,000 hours. Become an expert, okay, like in what you want to do. And three, get the connections, okay? Uh, and, uh, you know, go around the shows, go around the industry, make your name, make a name for yourself as a hardworking, bright, helpful, you know, individual. And you know what? The opportunities will come. And that to me is where it's it really, th that's how you do it. Uh, was the name of that book maybe Outliers, I think? That's right. Outliers. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Because, you know, I look at uh, the, the story that he tells, the first story he tells is about Bill Gates. And, you know, uh, Billy was a bit of a nerd and, uh, the his high school was the first high school ever to be connected to a computer because his and his best friend's father owned the a 360 three, IBM 360 a mainframe and he installed a a, um, a, uh, a terminal in the high school and so you know Billy being a nerd like he was on it all the time to the point where the father said well I have got nobody running the mainframe on weekend would you want to come and help out and you can use the mainframe. And so what did he do? He goes over there, you know, and by the time he was 21 years old, he had 10,000 hours. And when IBM said, well, Microsoft will never go anywhere, you know, he was like, well, no, I think I can do something with this, right? And so then he found, the, anyway, so you look at the story, and it's about getting the 10,000 hours, getting and, and have an idea where you want to be and then putting the people around you to make it happen. Yeah, really, really kind of goes back to the, the idea that there's no replacement for hard work and experience, right? No, no. But you also, you know, like luck has played a huge part in my life. And uh, I, I, I'm one of those lucky people okay my, my nickname is lucky pierre you know right so 
that my partner calls me Lucky Pierre for the last <laughs> like 40 years. Lasson, how can you be so lucky? And, you know, it, it's to my luck is uh, opportunity, uh, preparation, meeting opportunity, right? You, and so you have to prepare yourself and you have to put yourself in front of opportunities and be able to say yes when an opportunity shows up and not diddle, you know, like, oh, maybe tomorrow I'll wait. No, no, no. Make a decision. So, Pierre, we've never really had a, another time in history where we can expose our minds to, to more news than ever before. This can be both a good and a bad thing. So how do you go about evaluating what you choose to listen to for sources of, of information? Um, that's a, a, a very relevant uh, point that you're making, Tom. We are deluged by information. And you wonder, like, what is real, what isn't real? And uh, if I, I'm so I go always back to the source. I, I, I look at press release from companies. Do they have a real 43 101? I look at and then I frankly, I do my own work. OK, and then I compare what I think my numbers are with other people that I value. You know, uh, some of the analysts on Bay Streets are very, very good analysts. And uh, if I can see that the numbers are similar, I trust their opinion. And uh, that's kind of the way that I, um, I, I, I confront the, the deluge of information. There's just too much of it. And, you know, 90% I just, of the time I just tune out. Like, you know, it, it, it's not worth it. And when I invest, I, you know, I'm a guy who, um, you know, I'm in for the long run. Okay. I'm not into flip anything. I'm not a, I, I, I invest because like in the case of London gold, I own the stock for five years. Okay. I mean, I have a real, I know where I think, I know what the company is worth. It's going to go up and down and everything else. And I know where it's going to be the day it turns the, the mine on and you just sit there. Okay. Like, you know, I'm not a trader. I'm not, I'm, I'm a long-termer. And uh, that way I don't have to pay taxes every time I, you know, like I, you sell, you buy, you sell, you, you keep paying taxes. And at the end of the day, the government makes more money than you do. What's the point of that? Hmm. Well, Pierre, that's some, some sound advice for our listeners here. Um, is there anything else you'd like to, to leave them with before we wrap up? I think that uh, we are in an unbelievable uh, next to three to five year period. And, uh, you know, do your homework, uh, you know, look at the risk reward ratio. There's going to be a lot of, you know, beautiful, um, uh, you know, stocks that are going to be paraded around. But, you know, make sure that, that you have real value so that you can make real money in the market. Excellent, Pierre. We really Really, really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Tom, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you to your listeners. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.